All right, now we've gotten into your story and your, your tour in Vietnam in 71, 72, and we've, we've talked about a variety of your activities there uh, and rescuing orphans uh, at the time of the Easter offensive in the, early in the year. Uh, what else would you like to add to that? And well, as I was departing, I did discover, I didn't know who was on the ground, uh, but I found out in later years who it was, but I did find out that uh, the Air Force the two-star Air Force general, uh, commanding general for uh, air forces in that part of the world. In other words, the, the, the uh, I guess you call it Asian Air Force Defense mm -hmm. System. Or, but anyway, uh, he was relieved because he, he ran uh, bombing interdiction uh, runs into, over the, over the DMZ into North Vietnam and destroyed a lot of those uh, uh, fuel bladders. And I think that slowed down the, the, the uh, assault of, of those T-76 uh, uh, Soviet tanks, amphibious tanks, very effective tank, uh, but uh, couldn't, was, couldn't, couldn't stand up against our light, uh, and, and, any, any, uh, uh, any tank weapon. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was, a, that was a travesty because he saved a lot of American lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was always that tension of what one could and couldn't do. And by this time, there were an awful lot of political handcuffs on military operations, even more than earlier, because uh, the country itself was essentially disengaging by then. That's right. Okay. Uh, and then anything else that kind of stands out in your memory about that second tour in Vietnam? No, not really. Okay. All right. So now you get the middle of 72, the offensive is, was stopped. I mean, they did manage to hold on. There were some parts of the country were occupied and never regained, but they did push all the way back up to the DMZ around Quang Tri. Okay, so things were stabilized at least for the time being by the time you left. Okay, so when you come back now, what do you do? Well, I picked up my family. I had orders, a couple of things, and and uh, and I was uh, transferred to the uh, Army's military family. What, 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 no, not military. Uh, uh, college for uh, general, general and staff mm -hmm. officer development, and so I was. That that was me. I, I, I got there in August of 1972. Now. Two, and uh, and it was a, basically a year long. Okay. And where is that college? Th that's in. Uh, that's in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still there today. Yep. All right. Uh, now, was this um, part of a, a stepping stone to become a colonel or lieutenant colonel, or was this just? It, it was a progression towards uh, for for further assignment mm -hmm. and evaluation to be for, for potential. For, for, did you have for promoted. potential be promoted? And so, uh, yes, indeed. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, when I got there. Uh, I got in my class. The class was a, there was 50 of us in each class. I think that's correct. And we were broken down into four groups. Uh, uh, somehow they do that with that number. And, uh, and so we stuck together as a as sort of a team. And then you had within the team, you had sub, sub teams. So you could say that's a, that was a company with four platoons, mm -hmm. or that was whatever you want to call it with four elements to it. And, uh, I think we had majors and lieutenant colonels in that class, and that one, that was fine. Um, just about everybody is a, was a Vietnamese, a Vietnam experience. Mm -hmm. uh, there might have been one or two Korean. I can't remember. And so they they wanted to get, they wanted to do things right. They wanted to tidy in and make us a family. Not where not, not only a network of officers that could cooperate, work together in small groups. We didn't know that part. We knew that they were going to train us in something, and we weren't lined up in a regular schoolhouse formation. And uh, so that would invite the, and, and, and include and, and invite the families in, into whatever we did socially. Mm -hmm. So we were all uh, pretty much all living on the facility. Had built some new housing. Uh, it was not the old barracks. It was new new barracks. <laughs> in other words, uh, for for for. Uh, Military families, not not just the the, the, uh, the, the barrack kind of mm -hmm. configuration. So I became the social uh, the, the uh, 
whatever you want to call it, chief of uh, social operations and activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had some experience in that travel agency. So here we have another opportunity from, based on our past experience that my wife and I could work on. And we tried to uh, have something for the families, the, the, the students and the families uh, t together or separately uh, throughout the year. So we got started on that and there was other aspects that needed to be done too. And, and so those, those, those whoever, each, each one of those elements had their own little leader. So that's how we started. And then we would, uh, uh, I guess our, 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 our senior person was, was the class leader and so he would have to report to the Command General Staff College uh, cadre or commandant if, if the commandant was interested in one star uh, of what, what we're doing in all these areas to include the social side of it. They didn't want to lack that because mm -hmm. you, you need to keep that. And certainly that would play into, as they were assigned to command and staff positions uh, around the world to, to be that oriented towards that, having that, that uh, building rapport of the side of the house. Mm -hmm. So that, that turned out to be uh, uh, an adventure. Uh, one of the first things we did as an icebreaker, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> traveled down to Kansas City and, and uh, got a hold of their party boat and put about 100 people on that or 200 mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and uh, rented the whole thing, everything. And then, uh, so we planned that out and, and advertised it and everybody signed up for it. All, couldn't bring the children. We just you had to figure that out yourself. So you had to get babysitters. We ended up with about 35 to 37 car loads for all all of us. And that was that. Some of them were vans that were jammed and all kinds of things. And and so we got that ready. And then <clears throat> I went to the military police and I said, you know, we're going to leave at a time when the traffic is kind of tough right on the on a on a on a, on a port military fort, we're going to have to get out of here. So um, I appreciate if you just get, get that arranged. Then <clears throat> I got a hold of um, the uh, Leavenworth City Police and I said, you know, we're going to be coming out of there and, and we, we're going to hang up all your lights. And they said, where are you going? I told them. And they said, oh, we know exactly where that is. Um, let me get back to you. All right, so we get there, uh, maybe a week later, they told me, we got you covered. So all you do is you, you come out of the school parking lot, you gotta assemble something, come out of the school parking lot and you'll have an escort to the boat. Mm -hmm. So the military police were on the back end of that thing and they're on the front end of that thing. I had my two-way walkie-talkie, you know, I figured I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in here and talk. I had the lead, I was in the lead car and the guy in the back was gonna, I was gonna talk to him. It didn't even work. <laughs> it didn't work. It was a piece of junk. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't that stuff I was using in Vietnam. So anyway, so it took off. And, and the military police took us into, in, uh, out onto the main road that comes out of the post, and, and, and you make a left turn, and, and you're in, uh, and you're in uh, Lemworth City. And the city police picked us up there. And we made a right turn and came down alongside the river into Lansing, Kansas. And they dropped off, and the Lansing police took us down to the next place, and the state police picked us up over there and crossed over <laughs> here. <laughs> And, and we finally got there, and they, and they had us. They had us set up. They had a large parking area, so we rolled into the uh, parking area. And the only thing they cautioned us: now, if you're getting on a party boat, you can have a good time, good food, drink, good drinks, no drinking, and driving. Mm -hmm. No drinking, and driving. Gotcha. So we got on board, and it was a nice icebreaker. Folks got to know each other. Some of them knew it. Had some guys in. There were several a number of classes at the college at the same time, and and then so so they they re reacquainted themselves, and we got close to each other and spent more most of the time with our little group, but still knew some other people. 
and that that was really really positive. Mm -hmm. uh, but but those other people were were they, they sort of showed up, but it was mainly for our folks, and but that helped us a great deal, and also built some bridges for future engagement activities. So that was a good start, and then the idea is. When you do something like that, that big, you gotta you gotta outdo yourself the next time. But we had some smaller things that weren't quite as robust and didn't stir up the place. We kept them on, on the facility, or we would move it someplace and, and, and let them infiltrate. In other words, leave their house and meet us over and such and such. So we had a couple of things like that going on uh, in in the Leavenworth Greater area. And also shopping opportunities, uh, set them up and and, and possibly uh, get them to uh, uh, discounts. And one of the things that we had, which was tradition for Command General Staff College, we would have dad's night out shopping alone just before Christmas. And this turned out to be a real challenge. I had nothing to do with that, but I was falling in line with advertising it and telling them where to go. And there was a lot. Kansas City opened the door that night just for these guys, and they, they barred anybody else from coming into place. And just like when we, when we went, uh, I went on R and R to to. to uh, In, in, in Asia there to, where, where did I go? I went to... Uh, hmm. You were in Taiwan once and you were for... Did, uh, you, go to, did, you, did you go... The, 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 the other place where they... Bangkok? Or, huh? Bangkok? Yeah, I went to Bangkok. And, and you go into places and you just be looking around because I'd like to get something for my wife. And, and, and uh, I, I got some nice things. But they wanted to show me, they wanted to give me drinks all the time. And I, went, I didn't need that, so I drank a lot of tea. I, I, had, I had maybe a drink or something. But that, that, I, I, I wasn't interested in that because it was hot. Mm -hmm. Then you get sick. So anyway, uh, all these guys had been exposed to that same thing. Here we go to Kansas City, Missouri, and we're being exposed to that. They're just looking around. They're going and looking at dresses and things and, and negligees and uh, who knows, and jewelry. And, and they had these bargains, and oh my goodness, and I didn't realize. And um, police, the two police cars were sitting out there. They, they'd been through this before, too. And, but our guys, the ones that drank, didn't drive. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference. We had, they had some, in other classes, they had a, a rest when they got down there, because other folks picked up and did that, too, mm -hmm. before us, years ago. And, and, and okay, so not, 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 not on our watch. Mm -hmm. So these guys uh, did pretty well, and, and, and all of them came back. We didn't have anybody, quote, missing, unquote, <laughs> for a day, none of that stuff. And, and so they came back, and, and we, we, passed, we passed the muster of being good, whatever that meant. Mm -hmm. Our wives weren't mad at us for, they, they, they got upset because of what the money that was spent. So some things went back. But that was later. The intent was was okay, but mm -hmm. it was a little bit overwhelming. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I was very careful what I was shopping because I was short budget. But these other guys were also a short budget, and they they just, just really overdid it. Uh, so anyway, that that was that was really really excellent. <clears throat> but we did some things with the kids, with various scouting programs. We had. Uh, the, the Coast Guard uh, a cutter, we could get on that and, and, and do some things w w when it was, was docked. Uh, sometimes later on, my wife and I joined the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and we, we would take folks from our class with us. We bought a 25-foot a, 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 um, cruiser to sleep folks on it, so we'd take folks on that, and, or, or we could do something uh, alongside with the Coast Guard as auxiliaries. And, and we go rescue a buoy that got away and was floating around, and, 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 and that, that great big Coast Guard cutter, which was a towboat pushing you know, vessel, it, it wasn't, it didn't have, it didn't have storage for, for hauling things, but it, it had the strength to push barges. So we'd go into these sloughs and pull these things out. So they, they liked that. That was kind of adventurous. Um, and we had a hunt club. A fox hunt club. 
no fox. Mm -hmm. And they had they had uh, maybe a couple dozen of really nice horses. And so they, we, we got them involved in that. In other words, we tried to get them involved in the local stuff mm -hmm. and then do this with it with, with, with their families. And we kept doing that. And then, then, then maybe we would have something special in the officers club, uh, if not, I know it was keeping on the post pretty much, and that that was that was pretty much what we did uh, to to keep the uh, keep keep the building the morale and encourage each other. We also coached each other <clears throat> before each exam, and I, I got pneumonia before a final exam, my tactical examination. Only once, four-hour examination, and I got pneumonia, and I didn't know it. I was coughing and hacking and all this stuff, and I got, I medicated myself, and I went in there like this, and and uh, <clears throat> so took the examination, and I didn't think I did well at all. But I had learned something when I was enlisted man in the in, in 1957 when I took the intelligence course. They had a model for writing an order of battle report to teach or, or help the commander understand mm -hmm. the enemy weather and terrain. And when I came to that, I memorized all of that stuff. I just, I had a core dump. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was writing, but I got it down. And I, 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 I filled all the blanks too. Mm -hmm. I was probably the only one that did that. I got a, I got a B plus on that. And I, and I was half I was half lit. I mean, mm -hmm. all that medicine. Finally, they they had to really do some serious things because I had it was it was in my lungs real heavy, mm -hmm. and that's the first time. And it opened the door for a series of repeats. And years later, got through that. Uh, and then we then we got into electives, and I got into one of the electives that I was in. I had to go year long, and it had to do with systems analysis. And, and, and other kinds of things uh, uh, using um, systems analysis and operational method methodology or something like that. It's an executive level um, think tank uh, skill set. And what it does, it organizes your work in such a way that you can, you, you, you put it out in a plan and, and you work out some of the details of it, and then you execute and keep adjusting it here, and then when this comes along, it, it'll, it'll shape up when you, when you finish with what you started with, and, and you might not be exactly what you wanted to go, but it, it's done when you, when you get finished, you have a better solution than if you didn't organize. Mm -hmm. So I got that done, and, and, and got through the course rather well, and uh, graduated in June of 73. Okay, so basically a, a year, you have an academic year essentially uh, at Leavenworth. Okay. Now they said, just like they did in MI school, you, you, some people in the course here didn't get borders. There's several of us. Mm -hmm. We've got an assignment for, for you, you can't turn down. I heard that before. Mm -hmm. But I had no clue what, what I was going to do. So what they wanted me to do, and these other guys, they sent us all to a different university. I went to the University of Kansas to get a, a, a Master of Business Administration. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. All right. Was this a one-year program that you did, or a two-year? It was 18 months. Okay. 18 months. So they say three semesters, or hmm? they have three semesters essentially, or so you do oh, fall of. Well, it was two years, but but I, I got it done in 18 months. Okay, so you yes. got so you finish um, like well, early, early 75 or end of 74. End of 74. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and now, what does your family do at that time? I mean, do you buy a house, or do they provide housing? Well, uh, I was in government housing, and I rearranged some things in there, and they've never seen anybody come in and rearrange foolishness. They were just brand new. One of the things that was foolish is you had a front door that opened this way, like this, and you had uh, you had a, a, a storage room where you put your 
gardening, gardening, whatever, mm -hmm. that opened indoors. So, so okay, so this is this was this is fine. Uh, this would bang into this, but then you'd open it, up, whatever, and you get in. But this took up all this room, and so you, I, if I had a lawnmower, I, I, I had one of those push more things. I'd, I'd push it over here, and I have to shove it over here, and I do this, and then how do you get how do you get back in? So I, I took it off the hinges, and that thing opened up where it came like this. <laughs> so this would open like this, and you get that out of the way, and then it opened up, so you go in there and get out, in and out. So the door opened where, where you can get in and out direct to the, to the, to the lawn. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I put some fake, these squares, the fake squares on it, and I painted the door one color, and the squares, uh, 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 some kind of a uh, other, Complementary color, but different. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And I thought that looked so good. So I did that to the to the master, the front door of the house. Oh, the place looked sharp. And then inside, we did some few moves, a few new things around. Same thing. That if the faucets went the wrong way, because it'd be hitting something, like to change mm -hmm. it. So they send an they they inspect everything, and we know that. We learned that in Germany. We always every house we were in, any apartment we were in, in Europe. We passed with flying colors. Even when I was enlisted, and, and now I'm an officer, I knew what to do. I mean, spit shine everything. They they looked under stuff, and it was clean. It was shiny. Everything. It didn't matter what it was. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> they sent an inspector over, and he, he got halfway in the living room, and he stopped. He said, "Now, I got to get my boss." And he said, "I'll see you later, I think." So he left. <laughs> so his boss. The post engineer himself came by, and he walked through the whole place, everything, even the the pipes underneath were polished, uh, everything, and so he said, "I'm not supposed to do this. This is a violation. This is a violation of every code that we have. But you you improved this place. Here's your clearance. Mm -hmm. Good job. He walked out." <laughs> So anyway, my kids were involved with that stuff. I mean, they, they liked that, and Charlotte was too. Mm -hmm. We repaired all the walls. You couldn't tell where any pictures were hung. We repaired everything. So anyway, so uh, we left there, and we bought a house in Lansing, Kansas. It was a brand new house. And they had bulldozed the property around it. I mean, it was, it was clay. Mm -hmm. What did it grow on concrete? It had no trees. It had a nice driveway. It was, I think, it was three bedrooms, mm -hmm. and it had a bedroom downstairs and a bath, and uh, upstairs it had another bath. I think that's how it worked, and two car garage. And uh, I thought it was a rather sturdy house. We didn't pay much for it, so we got it. And so the whole family pitched in. Everybody got involved. Now while we, while we were getting pitched in and w working on that, and while I was at, at the Command General Staff College, uh, the former spouse was causing trouble. I had to, I had to go to court and do this mm -hmm. stuff and answer that question, go over there and, and do this and do the other, and, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, her, her husband, went to save money, went and he got himself a, a lawyer's degree. I don't know how he did it. And so he tried to represent himself, and they let him do it. And it, it, everything was convoluted, and she admitted uh, molesting, my, molesting my two daughters. But anyway, during that process, um, she, she was allowed to have visitation with the children at her house. I didn't trust that, so I was very reluctant. And I was upset. I didn't have plan B to go mm -hmm. raid the place. So anyway, the first time they visited, came back, and they didn't come back with my son. Nobody did anything. The judge said, is he in danger? Yeah. But he didn't, he didn't talk about value systems. They were teaching him how to be a pervert. Well, well where did you find out what he was doing? He was doing the same thing that my dad did, and he did the same thing as his stepdad was doing. He was an adulterer and an alcoholic with uncontrolled rage. That's not good. That is not healthy. My children were confused with all of that, and they learned how to, uh, accounting. She, my wife taught 
my, my first son, Michael, accounting, and he remembers it today when his paper route, how mm -hmm. to account for everything, account for your money. And, and, and she helped him with that in that process. So he never really was long in that, in, in that Lansing house. He, he, he was sort of, for our first year there, he was gone. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the rest of them, we, we, we worked on the property. So I went back on, I went back on Fort Leavenworth to the hunt club. Guess what they have in the hunt club? Great big manure pile. And they mix it with dirt. And then they mix it with dirt. They have to do it about four times because that stuff is hot. It'll burn mm -hmm. everything. And so we put about six inches of that around the property. And we lived there six years. And that and the lawn just was, it was lush. It was beautiful. My, my boys could cut it. I could cut it. My wife, my wife could cut it. It was really not difficult. Mm -hmm. And we put in a variety of trees that were local, even a, even a willow tree that got 50 feet tall before it was struck by lightning and then it blew up. <laughs> it was gone, I had to cut it down and dig it out. But uh, the trees were, were wonderful, different kinds of trees, shade trees and, and, and flowering trees and, and, uh, and I put bushes all around it and then repainted the house and then we had the inside foamed you could put a candle in, in wintertime, you put the candle on the, the dining room table and heat the room. It was really great stuff. Yeah. And, and, we, and we did some other things, but everybody did it together. So that, 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 was, that was really good. And then they did well in school. The children did well in school. And, and about uh, maybe our, in our third year in the house, we bought a 25-foot cruiser a Starcraft or whatever it was called. Yeah. And so we cruised the Missouri River. We learned how to fish and we'd swim in that water and, and that kind of stuff. And, okay. and, 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 and that, right. So that was a very positive time despite all this interruption. Right. And so you spent six years in that house. Now, did you go to different duty stations or were you able to stay in Kansas the whole time yourself? I, I was at one assignment, six years. Okay. And what assignment was that? And, and, and that was, uh, I was. Well, actually, a little more than six years. Mm -hmm. I was one year, uh, two years at, at University of Kansas, or mm -hmm. close to two years, and uh, six years plus, you know, a little, little, little fringy, mm -hmm. plus <clears throat> uh, in uh, uh, as a as a member of the uh, of the uh, staff. So I had one, wait, one year a student. Command General Staff, two years in the college, mm -hmm. and, and the rest of the time, four, four plus, so it's six plus years uh, that we're in Kansas. I, I, as long as I was in that Lansing house, I was on staff at the at the Command General Staff College. Okay, so now you're an instructor, basically. Right. Okay. Now, when I finished the University of Kansas, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up a name now that we, we heard before, mm -hmm. and I've known this guy since 1963 three or four, when I got orders to, I think, go to the Pentagon again. Mm -hmm. So the Commandant was a guy by the name of John J. Hennessy. So I went down to see him. I spoke to his secretary. Can I see the general? Sure, just a minute. And he hollered in, hey, Roger, get in here. I went in there and see him, sat down, and we talked about things. And this is when Colin Powell was in the communication section of the White House. He was being, he was being vetted. The last time he commanded something was he was a platoon leader. He never commanded a company, a battalion, a brigade, or chicken. And he was being raised up to general officer rank and also considered for a second star almost immediately and John knew about it. He told me about that. I don't know why he did that, but mm -hmm. he, he felt close to me that he could tell me anything. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I, I, I graduated from here and then I went to the University of Kansas and I, here there are my orders. I took those orders. He said, um, well, what would you like to do? I said, sir, I'd like to um, I'd love to be an author, instructor, and do some stuff around the college here. He said, do it. 
I'll keep you posted. A week later, I got a phone call from his secretary. You are now, you'll be transferred when you leave the college. You'll be transferred and you report to duty such and such. I don't know what they did, but you know what they did. Mm -hmm. And I worked for, I worked for him and, and, the, and the college that four years, four plus for the, some odds and ends added to that. Right. And so I, I was teaching anything to do with management. And, and then I had elective courses that had to do with uh, computer science, team building, There's some basic courses I had to teach too that was part of the core, and I can't remember what it was, but it still had something to do with computers, mm -hmm. some technical thing. And uh, I worked for a department, and, and you know, I've always had a lot, of, a lot of good close friends from West Point. So my full colonel, I was a major at the time, my full colonel was a West Pointer, and he was itching to become a brigadier, mm -hmm. and that's all, I, that's all I knew about him, nothing. He, I, I'd see him in the morning, I'd look at him, and he'd look at me. And I did that for a while, <clears throat> and remember now, when I, when, I, when, I, when I came back home, I had this new beginning that I was in basic training, mm -hmm. trying to learn what the Bible says, anything, anything. And so I got involved with some of the people George Kirkendall, a lieutenant colonel, he was an artillery officer, I believe, and so he took me under his wing, and he worked down administration. I was in the teaching staff, he was in administration. So he got me involved with groups, and post-chaplain, and I met a guy by the name of Jim Ammerman. You'll hear about him. He was a, he was a full colonel. So anyway, so I got involved with them, and, and, and they were teaching me ethics and other kinds of things that the Bible teaches. And uh, I started teaching these, these various classes, and, and I tried to, to learn some of the new things that I'd learned in the core courses that I took when I was a student, plus in what, some of the things, I got in touch with a PhD who was in the management division also, very senior uh, civilian. Mm -hmm. And he, and he he had me and a couple other fellows, three or four of us, to be his understudies. And so we taught a couple of pilot programs for small group dynamics, and and how to solve problems in small groups. And they were all straightforward. I mean, you looked at things and, and you just sort of arranged them and and they come out this way or that way, and all of them made sense. All of them were correct. Mm -hmm. It's the idea. The process had, was, had to be correct to make it, to, to get anywhere, and he knew it, we didn't. Well, we thought that was neat, and so I started teaching some of the things like that, other things you couldn't do that, because we were teaching Fortran, COBOL. Mm -hmm. I had learned those before, but I still had to teach them again, and BASIC, I mean, BASIC is what we used all the time, but the others were, 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 were Fortran, you, you needed for your math stuff, but the BASIC was good any time, mm -hmm. and you can mix. So then, in teaching the management courses, they gave me some latitude, and, 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 but I, I, the course had to be approved. And so finally, with that, uh, I even used the Bible for references and never got in trouble. And Moses was taught, don't waste your, by his son and by his father-in-law, don't waste your time by fooling around having everybody come see you. Why don't you delegate it? And I, got, I, I nailed that. And so I introduced some of this stuff, and then at some of the examinations we gave, uh, it, it was broken down in, in the, into groups, and the group had to work on something, and then they get closer to something as a, as a solution, <clears throat> and then, and then they, they, they keep going in, uh, until you, you come up with something. And uh, thank you. And so, so with that, um, uh, on one of the occasions, uh, I, they allowed, they gave me an allowance, and I go to places and I buy toys. I buy some really weird stuff, and these guys are, these are adult men, combat killers, and all mm -hmm. that stuff, and whatever. And 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 so, in one case, I got Tinker Toy sets, 
And, but I had, four, like every other, I had four groups. They were smaller. They weren't, they were less than 50. Mm -hmm. But anyway, maybe there were 28 of them in there, or, 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 or 40, or, but not, not 50. Anyway, so <clears throat> I, I, I would give these three groups the regular Tinker Toys, and I'd pour them out like that, and I'd say, I'm going to give you three questions. And then I come in with this monstrous Tinker yeah. Toy set, <clears throat> and dump it, and it'd fall all over the place. Okay, and now what I want you to do, and you have seven minutes, I want you to model yourself. That went pretty quickly. I mean, they just zip, zip, a couple things. The big guy, the, the big ones had a hard time, but they had model yourself. So they, 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 you couldn't do much with it, but you did something. All right, now one of you tell us um, about yourself. So he did, 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 did. All right, nobody, the rest of them didn't say much. All right, and th this is what I really got surprised about, and it's very, very real today. You take those kids and you get the same results. Connect with somebody next to you. These are mine. The other guy said, yeah, and these are mine. I didn't say, I, 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 got, I was getting mad at him. I, I had to walk out of the room. The first time I went through this, I came back, I said, you have three minutes. And all of a sudden, they, they, they were, hmm. so they did something like that, all right? So they did that. Then I said, uh, all right, the last question is, <clears throat> now connect with your group. That went quickly. They really got busy with that. And not every year did it the same way. Each, each, each week, but, but the hallmark of, of this whole mess was when I said, make a model of yourself with the big ones, they did something. Connect with somebody else. They took a chair and put it on a table and put a guy in it and touched it. And then I said, now, connect with everybody. And they put the model all around them. The individual is key to the team. They got an A. The others did too, because they had rational stuff, but it was different. Mm -hmm. Nobody built anything like that. Another time, and, and, and the commandant was um, a brigadier, and he was just a very gentle person with a keen sense of humor, but it, he was, it was dry. And so he came in, and I, and I didn't care what you did. Here are the questions. And um, you, I said, you, you, you can present it any way you want. No, no tinker toys. One guy came in with a banjo, and he was singing a song to Wild Bill. Wild Bill used to be a three-star general that ran TRADOC, or training command for the entire United States Army. Wild Bill come around with those absolutely off-the-wall stuff that we couldn't, we couldn't figure out, because it was just, it was, it was not developed. It was half grown and grown. So he was there and he'd have a refrain. Oh, this wild old Bill, we're just gonna get together. We're gonna, we're gonna mash our teeth and we're gonna get her done. Oh yes, oh, oh yes. So this general came in and nobody saw him. He came in back, I was sitting back here and I, I was I gonna see him. So I said, okay. So he sat next to me. He started doing this with his foot. He looked at me and gave me a punch. He says, good job. Tell him that. He locked out. <laughs> The guy that replaced, that was at my combat battalion, at the time I was S2 and I was leaving, a guy by the name of Lewis L., Lieutenant Colonel Lewis L., he came in during one of my, one of these last sessions, and, and uh, we were getting ready for it, and, and, and I was giving them instructions, getting them ready, and uh, we had some definitional things that they asked before the final exam. So he walks in, and, and I'm trying to finish those up. He said, I got something to share with you all. You, you don't mind, do you, uh, Major? Oh, oh, no, sir, I don't mind. I said, you idiot. I, I was furious, because these, these guys were on a roll. They're getting ready. They were going like this. I said, you couldn't study for this thing. I don't care what you do. To go to bed, or if you get drunk, or you stay sober, whatever it is you do, just you, know, you can't get ready for this exam that you're going to face tomorrow. Anyway, so they, they were getting ready. 
and 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 so he he, he talked about how important management stuff is and this is an excellent course and you got the best instructor we got I don't know where he got that from best instructor we've got in, in this subject and stuff like that and and so uh, I expect you all to do well and, and as he walked out he turned to the group and said I don't know anything about management and he went out and closed the door and I said amen and the place exploded <laughs> <laughs> he never got promoted mm -hmm. he never got promoted but they had their exam and they all did well so that, that, so I did a lot of that kind of stuff, and that was kind of fun. And 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 um, the serious stuff was we had some people that were over over stressed, and 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 so I, I also had a I, I taught the entire class on stress management, and I didn't know anything, but I did a lot of research and I had stories. And we went in the auditorium, and um, uh, we, we we taught that. And the, one of the former, uh, one of the uh, f former uh, leaders we had, the general that, that was over the school, was he, he was obnoxious and he, he was loud and aggressive. It wasn't Louisville, but he was like Louisville, but he still had a had a had a side that was really he meant what he said, in other words. Mm -hmm. And he came in and I said, "Oh my goodness!" and uh, so uh, he said, let me introduce your instructor. He was a three-star at this time or something. And, and so he, he mentioned me and talked about, yeah, you got the best instructor we got to teach this stuff. I've never taught it before in my life. And, and so I don't know what he was talking about, but he was in one of those moods. Mm -hmm. He was a two-star. And he was the colonel I told you about. He was, when I was working in that same, okay, this guy left as a brigadier, got promoted and came back. And one day I came in and I'd been through some of these courses about uh, forgiveness. And so I decided I got to take the initiative to build rapport with this colonel who wants to be promoted. Mm -hmm. now he, got, he got one, I think he got, he, yeah, he got that one promotion and then he got another one. So anyway, I came in one morning, I came in about 6.30, and he was, he's coming upstairs, came in, walked in his office, and I hollered down the hall, good morning, Colonel, whatever his name, Jones. And I walked in the office, and um, I thought, oh, that's embarrassing. I just made a jackass, jackass out of myself. Mm -hmm. You don't holler at anybody down there. Whoever heard of that? Anyway, I went home and I shared that with Charlotte. She said, it, it, what do you call that, progress or, or failure? I said, you know, i got to think about it. It's progress. I was getting over myself. Mm -hmm. well, I did that for about six weeks. Every morning that I'd see him, I didn't see him every morning, but every time I saw him in the morning, good morning, Colonel Jones. And, I, and he'd look, you know, as if nobody was there, and I'd go in my little office. All right. It's, it's, Time passes and I'm walking down the stairs from the second to the first floor. I said, good morning, Colonel Jones. He says, good morning, Rods. And I almost fell down all the stairs, boom, boom, <laughs> <laughs> and had a good rapport with him. Mm -hmm. Now, on one of these occasions, I gave an examination based on uh, synergy. And every, the cl my class I taught, they all got lousy scores. And he counted that as a training event where I would learn something, and they gave more high numbers for putting up with it. Mm -hmm. Oof! I didn't know that that existed. I didn't know that that existed. So anyway, that was kind of fun. But he said this is very important because we're having we're having trouble among in the ranks with stress management. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to handle stress management. Now, for context here, now we're talking kind of mid late seventies. Uh, that's a period when the army, I believe, is reducing itself in size. You had they had a riff going on yeah. that would that would ch choke a horse. Yeah. So these people are trying to make careers in the army. You have to keep moving up, or you're out, essentially. That's no. Yeah, that's right. And and the mediocre and and some of the really sharp ones were eliminated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's there are reasons for for the stress issue uh, beyond maybe just the normal ones in a regular time. Okay. 
but this 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 PhD was it was a good good. Um, he was he was a good source of encouragement. He's a mentor. I didn't have a mentor. Mm -hmm. He was one of them, and so that was that was that was important. Uh, one of the other thing is, in 1976, I was still teaching there, but it, these guys. This uh, George Kirkendall, mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> he called me to a meeting, and they were having a, some kind of a Bill Glass crusade in in Rona proper, and they had a group going into the U.S. disciplinary barracks uh, on post, and also the, the Leavenworth Big House downtown, and also the ladies and the men's uh, prison, state prison in Lansing. And uh, so George said, why don't you go over to the disciplinary barracks? We come to our meeting and then, and then go over to the disciplinary barracks. And he, he already coached everybody because he, George knew all of us. So I went over there and I met and, and Bill Glass and, and, and also Roger, whatever his name was, football player. Staubach? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I was with him about three times in a couple places. Anyway. Went over there and I wore my bib overalls and my number was 65. They didn't know I was an officer at all. And so I we went through a couple of days of that. It was a great learning curve. And, and these people that are, are star athletes would get up and give their testimony. And then we would sit with the guys and process that. And then they'd go to another event where somebody would do the same thing but a different kind of a presentation, but the same format, <clears throat> and encouraging guys to get out of themselves and, and, and get into something that would give them some, some really hope and courage and, and stamina and, and, and energy. So, you know, all the right things. And so, um, the Lord laid it on my heart to show up on Sunday in my uniform. I was in my dress A uniform. You know, my cord mm -hmm. and my combat junk and stuff that you wear. And wearing my blouse boots because I was airborne qualified. <clears throat> and I used that. So uh, Bill Glass came, saw me coming and he said, I was praying for somebody in military uniform show up, but I didn't know who it was. So I gave my testimony, and that helped. Mm -hmm. And that helped me to get out of myself, but it also helped them to get out of themselves. So for the last two years I was at Leavenworth as an instructor, I was on Tuesday nights in the prison. Mm -hmm. And at some one point, I, I, I got close to a guy by the name of Sonny Knight. He comes from New Mexico, Albuquerque. I think what he did is he had a disagreement with his first sergeant, and he cold cocked him. So they put him in prison. I don't know how long. Threw the key away. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so he was in there, and and uh, so he, he he said, you know, after after being with him for about eight eight or nine months, he said it'd be nice if. Could you come and see me on a, you know, it's getting, the weather's getting kind of nice. Could you, could you come see me sometime? So I gathered the kids in Charlotte, took a picnic basket, they checked it all out, and we went to see, inside the compound and had a picnic with Sonny. We did that about four, five, six times. And I'd always sign in, <coughs> it would be Sonny Knighton, his name and my name, Roger Talmage, relationship family member. And, and the guards, yeah, okay, because they'd see me on Tuesdays too, mm -hmm. and the chaplain would come over there and wave. He never came in, he didn't monitor anything. So those guys taught me more than I ever taught them. They were reading the Bible every day. I read, I read it when I could, but I could, I never did study it mm -hmm. to that depth. I, did, I, I shout. So anyway, this, the, the, the last year while I was there. Uh, some months later, after uh, I was getting ready, before I, I, I left in I left in '78. Okay, so before I, I left, um, and that was June or July. But anyway, I came in that Tuesday night, and it was raining out. And it was, oh, it's really not 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 very nice night. And some, I heard this voice says, "Hey, bub." Oh, there's a, Marine, a military police woman. I said, yes, Captain. How may I help you? Well, young man, you come in here, and, and I, I have some questions for you. All right, yes, ma'am. 
you visit, you come visiting, don't you, on Sundays? Like, yes, ma'am. He said, well, the record shows that you've been coming in here several times on Sundays visiting Sunday night. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. He said, you bring in your family too, don't you? Where's this going? Um, yes, ma'am. Well, now, you mark down it's your family, all of you, family to Sonny Knight and he to you. Yes, ma'am, but he's black and you're white. I said, Captain, took you three or four months to figure that out. I walked away. That was <laughs> stupid. But that's the kind of thing. And that really helped me, too, because I, I got some other situations that I'm going get, to get involved in. Did you need that? My wife went to the women's prison, and I go to the men's prison in, 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 in Lansing. I got in the big house, and those guys are older than me, all white-collar workers. I mean, they, 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 they extorted some money. I couldn't even count that high. I don't have that many feet and toes, toes and fingers. And, and they said, well, young man, you came to see us. We don't care what you tell us, but just as long as it's from the Bible. And they, they were mentors. Mm -hmm. They were really good mentors. That's a hard place to get into unless you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But that, I, I, I don't have anybody follow. I, I never got a follow up out of them. I, while I was, while I was at, at um, no, it was later. Okay, we left, we closed the shop and put the house on, up for sale and headed towards Washington, D.C. for an assignment, not to the Pentagon, but to the, uh, uh, to the Army Military Personnel Center, Personnel Management Center, and that's in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. So I came up, and, I, and I, just before I left, my Jewish boss, who replaced the colonel, Called me up and said, "Hey, Raj, I want you to put your blue, you know, your, your green uniform, your green class A uniform, and come over to the college. We're having a little formation. We'd like you to be there." Yes, sir. I, I didn't ask why. And I got there. My wife's there. My kids there. I said, "All right. Well, maybe we're going to have ice cream and cake together." And they promoted me to lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. And so my boss was Jewish, and I used to greet him in Hebrew, and he'd answer back to me in an appropriate manner. And I'd send him, what is it, uh, gifts for Passover, and he'd send me plates that had the Ten Commandments or something about mm -hmm. Jesus is risen or something. <laughs> he'd send me this yeah. Christian stuff. Anyway, so, so he said, Roger, you got something to say? I said, sir, praise the Lord. He said, I knew that. I, I, he, I knew you were going to say that. And that was the end of it. I didn't say anything else. So, so that was, the, and we still have that friend. He's a wonderful man. And when I got sick there and I thought I had something really wrong with me, he'd come visit and his wife would say, muzzle talk, which means well. And, and, and so they, they were really sweet to Charlotte and myself. So I left them and ended up working for a gentleman uh, in in um, Alexandria. He was a single corps officer, a very fine gentleman. He was a uh, single corps officer that, he was, a, he was a colonel and he had commanded large units, small ones, bigger ones, and bigger ones. And this is one of his, this is one of, one of his staff assignments. And he'd been in the Army a long time. So that's why I started working for him. And my job was <clears throat> administration. Uh, in other words, taking, all, taking anything to do with computers and reducing whatever they're doing to some, to some usable, readable form. So I, I did that. They, they were processing, there were five different skill sets that they were asking for uh, in, in the combat support arena. That meant Corps of Engineer, Chemical, Military Intelligence, two more. And, and so those, those, they would recruit those and, and vet them and study them and recommend them to boards for promotion or school. And I would process, they, they, they'd come up with this work and I'd process that and give it to them and they'd send it to the place where that, that would happen. Mm -hmm. 
and I did that uh, from 80, I mean from 78 to 81. I was in it. I was in that as brand new lieutenant. I mean, I, they, 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 they just shined. It was just ridiculous how bright they were because they weren't. There was no dust on them yet. So I, I got in. I was in there for about ten days. And remember this. Remember I mentioned Jim Ammerman. That word's coming back now. So I had a mission to do. And uh, so I sat at my little desk, and all, these guys are over here. And my, my ladies, I had a bunch of ladies that did all this administration, and they were a hoot. They, they, they were, I, later I moved my desk over there because why would I want to be in the outfield when all the work was going in here? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the executive officer was here, and, and, the, and the division chief was here, the full colonel. Mm -hmm. And this was under a directorate, which was directed by a, a brigadier general. So he had the officer's directorate, and then these guys had combat, combat service and combat service support mm -hmm. uh, assignments and education. So I, 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 that, that happened later. But anyway, here I was sitting in this desk by myself and these guys were chuttering around and they, they ignored me because <coughs> the, the interaction was with this. Mm -hmm. These people were crunched their work. So finally the tenth day I came to work and I got up enough guts and I dialed the phone number to the commanding general's office, General Himes. Hayes, Haynes, Haynes. And um, secretary answers General Haynes' office. I said, ma'am, this is Lieutenant Colonel Talmadge. I'm new to the command. I need to speak to the commanding general. She says, he's busy. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I still need to speak with the general personally. He's busy. I'll take a message. I said, ma'am, you will not take a message. I do have a message you can give him, though. You can give him. Tell him Jim Ammerman has sent an ambassador to see him with a special message. And it's Lieutenant Colonel Talmadge, T-A-L-M-A-D-G-E. And I hung up. Three minutes later, the phone, our phone rings on my desk. I pick it up, Lieutenant Colonel Talmadge. Sir, he'll see you now. So I went up to see the general. He was, he was on the what floor and I was on the fourth floor. And I go up and went wherever he was, walk in, introduce myself to her. She said, just go right on in. So I did. I opened the door. I said, good morning, General Ames. How are you, sir? Have a seat, son. I sat down. And you know how soldiers are. They talk about soldier stuff. Mm -hmm. He was airborne and he did his stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I didn't have my stuff on, but, but and he didn't check me out. I just told him, I, where I had just come from and teach. Oh, you were, yeah, you were teaching it down there and doing those things. Yeah, yeah. John Hennessy used to be uh, the commandant there. I said, yes, yes, sir. Uh, and I served with him. And okay, so now wait a minute. Now you have a message for me. I said, yes, sir. I sure do. It's a personal message, and I got to eyeball you. To I got to look in your eyes and tell you this message. And it comes from Jim Ammerman. Yeah, he was my chaplain when I was brigade commander as a colonel, that lieutenant colonel at the time. Lieutenant Colonel Chaplin would call me up and remind me every uh, every Friday about what my what my priorities ought to be on Sunday. So what did he tell you? Well, this is basically the same thing, General. <clears throat> be sure this Sunday to be in chapel. He said, "What?" He started laughing. He said, "That's the message." I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "Well, I I, I believe it." I said, "I got another purpose for being here. You know that." He said, "Yes, sir. I'm sure." And he said, to me, he says, yes, I know, I'm sure. And said, well, sir, it is. Uh, I also learned that you assess, you train, sometimes to a full retirement, you're enlisted and you're officer uh, chaplains. Yeah, that's, that's our job. It is. But you don't have a chaplain assigned to this command. This command has 2,500 people in it. Half of them are civilian, and the other half wear this uniform. And, and so the generals well, and so so I'm your new I just came up to tell you that I'm, I'm your new senior chaplain he says great uh, colonel get out so I left I don't know how many days passed the secretary calls as if we're, I'm still sitting there and furthermore the general wants to have a prayer breakfast in January like all the big boys in the Pentagon
You know what happened in January 1979 in Washington, D.C.? I should. It locked down all of the metro system, knocked out a lot of electric lines, caused absolute bedlam in, in, in the city and the county areas. Blizzard? Absolutely, and 200 people showed up at, the, at our little boy's <laughs> rare breakfast. Mm -hmm. The general was happy with that. He thought that was cool. And what they did, the office did, ordered up, ordered up some lieutenant general, who I, I don't know who it was, and he came in to give a talk. And so we had, we had some music, we had a guy give a, pre, a little introductory introduction, uh, and, and prayer. We had another guy get up and offer another prayer in Hebrew and sing some more. And then he was introduced and he got up. He says, I, I come from the desk, perf I mean, the desk ops, uh, the, the operation side of the house. And uh, I'm one of the exec executives there. So I, said, I don't know who, I, I don't know who would out, out rank him. I don't know who it was, but nonetheless, he, he was in operation, and he, he said, I'm prepared to give a presentation about 20, 20 25, 30 minutes on, on the deterrent uh, measures we're taking against the Soviet armored threat. I think I'm in the wrong place. He gave, he gave his briefing, and they applauded him, and it was dead. It was, I mean, many people who really didn't care about religion were really attentive. I don't, I don't think they made notes. So he left. Anyway, I went back up the front office and I, and I also bumped into a, a, a general who was in, in, he was in another director. You have a director for officers, you have a director for enlisted, you have a director for something else. This was a guy, I think for enlisted, his name was Mitchell. And, and he, he's, he had his aide get a hold of me. And so I came over to see him. He said, can I be your helper? Okay. Now, uh, so we've made it now to January of 79. You, you made yourself essentially the head chaplain of, of the, the unit you're working with, uh, and you were talking now about having tried to stage prayer breakfast, and then um, an officer from another unit has now asked to be your assistant. And Mitchell, uh, and you can pick up the story from there. Yeah, okay. So. Now, I was the senior chaplain. I had no, no administrative help whatsoever from anybody, nor any juniors, so I had to recruit those. Also, uh, General Mitchell was a, a, a director uh, of one of, of the enlisted directorate, and, and my senior uh, on my side, the officer side, was also a brigadier general, but he was in charge of the officer assignments and stuff. But General Mitchell put out the word that he would, oh, I'd love to assist what you're doing and, and, and maybe coach you. His first advice to me was, you've got to go up to that front office and tell them that you will make recommendations. They will choose from those recommendations because you know what the program looks like and how the flavor, uh, what will carry the day. Uh, sending somebody from the Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations would have been good to send it to Fort Knox to the Armor School or Fort Benning to uh, one of their uh, schools in uh, uh, that kind of environment. So, after that, for quite a while, uh, in following years, uh, I was there. Uh, I, I rec make, make, those, uh, make some of those re recommendations, and, and, and it worked just fine. And, and we, had, uh, we had no trouble. Uh, let's see now. Just for reference at this point, so how long were you in that job? How long were you at that place? I was at that place until 1981. Okay. All right. So. All right. Now, I then received orders to Fort Huachuca, wherever that is, and Sierra Vista, Arizona, which is 70 miles, I think it's southeast, I think I had that right, of Tucson, Arizona. And I was to be the deputy chief of staff for personnel and community activities. It had a um, payroll that exceeded any, well, exceeded the state of Arizona, for one. It had everything to do with uh, 
personnel management, civilian and military, and also had to do with morale uh, and anything that what you can do to improve the morale of not only the military personnel but maybe the civilian personnel that were working there as a, as, as a regular folks and their families. And, and, and then it had anything else that would come along with that, uh, such as well, in the morale area, <clears throat> that's part of it, it, it managed all the clubs, officer and enlisted clubs, uh, the, uh, the uh, what is it, the uh, pro, uh, pro uh, golf course, that, the skeet, uh, business skeet shooting, uh, you also had the only military army, uh, military herd of, of horses and a, 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 and a mule, the one that's in the parade that, where the, the boots are in backwards of, of, uh, of our president when, when deceased. That, that, that one's out there. And, and then you also have uh, five bulls that you use for, uh, uh, you make a lot of money on those, they said. In, in, in your rodeos. People pay good money to get bucked off those things, make a lot of money on it if you know how to handle it. You're also in charge of the library and the post exchange and anything else we can think of that would be having to do with personnel, wellness, and so forth. Did you take this job? Oh yeah, I didn't know what it was. It was equivalent to a battalion assignment. I got 10 divisions with over 1,100 personnel, civilian and military, working for me directly. And some of the, two of these civilians' positions outranked me. I was Lieutenant Colonel, and they were, they were SES 14s. I mean, G, GM 14s. I should have been a full Colonel. I took, and I was a young Lieutenant Colonel. Mm -hmm. So I took over that job. And when I got there, we bought a house right away because there was nothing on post. It was, everything's too small. I had, I had all those children. Mm -hmm. I had, Five children by then, and and <clears throat> and, and uh, so we got we bought a house with a little swimming pool in it and set up camp. I didn't know how long I was going to be there. Uh, who knows? I could retire. And then uh, and and then uh, uh, they sent me to school for the for this particular type of work. And General Elton, uh, who was the deputy chief of staff of personnel now, he was a three star. He, he wanted, he was putting a lot of emphasis on that in order to, 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 to solidify, to solidify the health and wealth and whatever you call it, and progression of our military and civilian communities with their families of, uh, of, for all things. Mm -hmm. And so all of these had something to do with that. Uh, I was even involved with the hospital from a, from a uh, gentleman's standpoint, but I had no authority, but I certainly took, I got involved with them as, as trying to, what, what can I do for your role? So mm -hmm. I'd ask them for, what, what can we do for you? The same thing with the chapel program, all morale. Your health is important to us, and spiritually, uh, your, your, your growth. So I got into all of that, and, and even the school system. I was in charge of some things to do with the school system. Did the base have a school system, or is this the one? Oh, that's my, we had, we had an elementary school that was very good. We had uh, a middle school downtown and a high school downtown. So the elementary school was something we took, took we, we didn't direct anything, uh, but we just o oversight, to, to, to facilities worked well, uh, the right kind of people were, were recruited and, and uh, competent, and also very, very positive towards our military uh, and civilian family. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a remote site, so they get special attention. And he wanted to make sure that he had, uh, he had that kind of an environment going on. He demanded it. So I went to school for that and, 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 and did quite well in the course, got through it, and uh, networked with people who were really good at this stuff. I, I, wasn't, in, I wasn't in personnel management, I did other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was in the personnel, uh, Army Personnel Command there, or, or center, uh, and, and, uh, but that was pushing paperwork because other people knew what they were doing. I didn't know the intricacies of policies, but I knew of what I needed to do to process to ensure that the success of it based on the recommendations of those who authored those kinds of documents and the seniors supporting it. They, they'd give me guidance and our people would, we would respond to that. Okay. 
Uh, and now Fort Huachuca is one thing it's still used for. They do a lot of training of intelligence officers there, and there's a lot of that kind of. That was one of that was one of that intelligence was was one of the um, branches that we serviced. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I, so I, I knew a lot about them, but not the process of getting them in, into and so forth. All right. Now, how long did you stay in this position? I was in that position um, until 1983. Okay. So, that's 81 to 83. All right. And uh, when you look at that time, uh, what in particular stands out about that experience or things that you did there? Well, we invented a few things. <laughs> um, I was learning, and, and, I, and I really networked hard with, with anybody I knew in Washington, D.C., uh, in morale, welfare, kinds of things, and also uh, financial matters. I got close to one full colonel in the Pentagon in, in, in these matters, and, and uh, with his support and guidance and stuff like that, we put together proposals and we won $43 million worth of improvements to Fort Huachuca. We, we rebuilt everything that was standing still, basically. Mm -hmm. Took all the pools down, down, to, down to ground level, uh, and kept the shell, but, and re rebuilt those. And instead of having five Corps of Engineer people walk around testing the water multiple times a day, we put these drip line uh, computerized systems that if an inkling of anything changed, it would put the right chemical in at the right time with enough lead time that by the, by, by the time, time it was noticeable uh, in a, whatever scale that was that it was watching, it, it, it would be back to its normal. It didn't take long for all of those. And we have, <clears throat> I think, two outdoors and at least two outdoors and, and one in, indoor pool. The one indoor pool was an Olympic pool. We re redid the whole thing. We put baffles in it to make a difference. So you could you could do you could work your laps, and you put the baffles in it, and you could work it at, as a measured lap. So mm -hmm. you, you you couldn't go this far, but you can go half and back. And still get get your practice, and then when you were in uh, any kind of competition, you, you could swim the full mm -hmm. length, and and have that have that experience. And the first thing I did, I started with the enlisted field house, and made an enlisted spa out of it. The officers were really, oh, they were really, mm, mm, mm. they thought that was all right. But the enlisted men gained by that because it had tile in it, it had a great shower system uh, for for that, and had good good equipment for. All kinds of ways of exercising. We put in we put in a, an array of of uh, what is it these um, s solar system, and it heated the entire water system for the, for for them for showers and the pool and all that stuff. We could regulate all that, and it was just absolutely like a like, like a spa, and and uh, color color coordinated, really looked sharp. Mm -hmm. The only thing that the general the two. He was a two-star general. He he wanted security in that place, and nobody could figure out how to secure the place when it was open. I didn't have enough people to be on duty to keep them from coming in all the doors because there were a lot of fire doors in there. So finally, I I, 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 I traveled different places in, in the United States, and I went to one place, and they had these doors like you have here with the handles on them. In this, the, the one to push handles, and they simply put a U in it, dropped it in there, and you couldn't open doors. So I came back. We made a whole bunch of those, <laughs> and all the doors were closed during what, what, what had that hammer went, went, went down on it uh, when when uh, when the place was closed. When it opened, it would open because it would be off because you had to have easy uh, avenues of egress. Mm -hmm. So people couldn't sneak in there anymore. They came in the regular way, and then these doors would lock. Uh, so they come in the regular way, and then if they want to go out those doors, they could go out the doors. We, we keep the use out of them. Mm -hmm. So we, the, we, we met the fire code. Uh, and there's some other things that we did too, but I got eaten up on that pretty badly. The food in the officer's mess was a, um, a club was a mess. We redid that color coordinated because I had some artillery officers. I had some stuff that looked like 
Irish or, or Scotch, whatever it is, uh, design, and then the bright red for, for runners. And, and they, they, so, so those officers liked it, especially a retired major general who lived downtown. He came in and he loved it. So he, he became my he, he became my consultant. He said, can I be your consultant? Mm -hmm. I was a lieutenant colonel at the time. He said, not care about that. He said, I want, I, want, I want to do this. So he helped me with all of them. We, we redid the non-commissioned officers club. He was interested in that. And then we redid the enlisted club too. And we made a feature in the non-commissioned officers club. We want you to make your profit in food. So we, we got after some folks that knew how to cook well. And we started making money on that stuff. You always can make money on alcohol, mm -hmm. but we were trying to downgrade alcoholism, and so that that began to take a take 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 form. Mm -hmm. In the in the chapel program, I brought the Gideons International on board. I was a member of that already, and I used to pass out Bibles at the elementary school when they come to school, and the military plant came to arrest me. So I asked them, please. Please call your your your. Um, I guess it was a major. Please call your major, and have him talk to me. So they got on the line and called him and said, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom would like to talk with you. And what's this for, Sergeant? Well, he's passing out Bibles at the elementary school. He said, Leave him alone. And they drove off because that was authorized. Mm -hmm. Every post camp or station you come in, it has a guardhouse at the entrance. Um, and Betty Cottrell, her husband, Colonel Cottrell, was the commanding officer of the post. He was the post commander mm -hmm. for Fort Huachuca years ago, and he died some 12 years or more before I got there. Mm -hmm. So she, was, she became a coach of mine, a self, self whatever you want to call it, proclaimed uh, advisor mm -hmm. about how to, how to engage and, and uh, assist uh, 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 widows. All right, so she, she'd come visit me whenever she had a case of the jaws about something, especially what, what they would butcher somebody, uh, some, some decedent, and she'd have me get involved with it. I had no authority, but I'd, I'd get involved with those that did the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the medical side of it, where they'd take somebody down as a cadaver and, and find out what, why they died and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But they wouldn't be so uh, mean and but whatever else that she was interested in. But she taught me a lot and I, I just kept my mouth shut and learned a lot. So what we did together, based on her leading, went to the commander and we created an organization called Widow's Information Center. And, that was the, and we moved the military police out of that building and put them in it and put a great big sign, stop here. And so the, 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 the widows were there, and so they, the people would stop for information, and they, they could give them information down to the cat's meow, particularly for families with, with children. Okay, so Widows Information Center means information center run by widows rather than information for widows. That's right. Okay, good. Just one of them. Information for the world. Yeah. So anyway, so, and then, now, for the information for the widows, she had meetings, and I'd sometimes come there or just sit there and say nothing. And she had uh, different kinds of things that she would have them do. Some of them were good at crocheting, and so they made things. They made blankets for people in the hospital or as something for their lap, whatever. Uh, we had many of those became uh, uh, grand grandparents, adopted grandparents, and they'd go after our, our nursing home, you know, their care, and, and, and they'd adopt black, yellow, red, China, but it doesn't matter who they were, children, and they became the grandmas, and they'd come in and help out and, and level off some of the some of the edges that a family might have, because we had we had uh, some of our cadre were in the intelligence business, and, and there's a lot of spiky stuff going on there, and, and the others were in a large signal brigade. We only have two of them in the world, in the United States, mm -hmm. I should say, one of them that takes care of the east, uh, west, and the other one takes care of the east. And so in the West, uh, 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 that, those families, sometimes they, they deploy to do things, to, to do some work in an area that's been hit by maybe a storm, so they, they, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, or overseas for some operation to fill out a, maybe a, some, some uh, uh, unit has deployed and they, and they need that set up their base mm -hmm. operation. And they're real good about that stuff. They're really smart and fast. 
and the intelligence community the same way. They had to, su to support, but they had the intelligence school had training and a, a, a wide variety of things. I was trained in every field they got except for one. So I was, I was glib in that, and they they thought because I was working for the the the, the, the post that I was I belong I was Signal Corps, mm -hmm. and they, and they shunned me until they found out who I was. One of the one of the schoolhouse buildings in Fort Holabird uh, is named Benjamin Talmadge. He was General Washington's coordinator for six spy rings along the eastern Atlantic coast here uh, during the Revolutionary War. He's my great, 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 great grandpa. Mm -hmm. His son, Richard, was spelled Talmadge with one L. He spells his name with two L's. He's still one of us, or mm -hmm. I would one of him. Anyway, so we got along just fine. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I loved the, the, the intelligence school as well as I did the brigade. Okay. And so we tried to keep things that way, but I had 24 other units, uh, Department of Defense or other units on post doing some very important work, and they were operatives, and all this other stuff that was there to, to, to take care of their either the civilians or the military in, in their regular routine daily uh, work. So I worked on that and, and tried to keep up with it. And, and I, I depended on the skill set of the people who were running it to, to make it right, or I get in there and mixed it up and, and, and got help to change folks around mm -hmm. that were not functional. I got after people that got sick, got sick a lot. And one guy, uh, we relieved and put him in the personnel management arena and relieved him from his job because the doctor told me if he drinks one more drink, his, his kidneys will crystallize. His wife left him and they sold the house and he lost his family because of that. And that broke my heart. So I was sued for, I don't know, maybe 100 or $180 million for that. And uh, I was represented by the Army and I, during the court case, and they were trying to figure out what to do, and, and his uh, his attorney was trying to get the money because of he he racial stuff. He's one of my black brothers. We we had a Bible study together and all that stuff. So I was I was his relative. Why is he coming after me with that stupid thing? So I saw him in the hallway with his new girlfriend, and I, his nickname was Doc. I said, Doc, I know you're here for what you you think you you need to get done. And, this young lady, I don't know who she is, but I love you, brother. And I walked off. And I thought, man, that was stupid. But the Lord protected me. And so that job was made open, and, and other folks went to went, went fight for it. And uh, so that was, I recommended the two ladies because they were sharp. They protected them. They covered him. So they su sued me for $360 million because neither one of them got We got a, a, Native, a Native American in there to run the EO shop. And I didn't tell them anything. That, that They cleared that before the, it was the day before we were supposed to gather and I, I flew in from my next assignment and uh, so they canned it. I never went to that that, that, that proceeding. I'm trying to understand it, why were you being sued at all? Because they didn't get selected for the position and I thought, I just recommended mm -hmm. And the, the up staff, I, that's all I, I saw. I could because mm -hmm. they were, these are, they, he was a, a, a GM 13, and I could recommend th that position mm -hmm. for the two 12s or, or eight, any anybody who qualified. And mm -hmm. any, these two women did. They did excellent work, and I could prove it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so once they found out what I did, the, 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 their representative, they dropped it. So that that was two. That was two for two. I said that was crazy. One of the things that happened when I was there, the Army ran out of money as far as morale and welfare, and they decided, mm -hmm. we're not going to fund morale and welfare. You figure it out on your own. I'm a remote station. How do I get it? Who's going to give me any money? Mm -hmm. So I, I talked to some of my buddies in other post camps or stations, and uh, I researched across the United States and found three, three carnivals triple ratings, and I found one that was available and hired him, and I brought in a carnival. And then, uh, but I had to, we had to, he had to make, 
it was for four days, and on day three, if he didn't bust a million, he, he, he was in trouble. I mean, I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. It cost me $5,000 to rewire places for people to come and do things. Mm -hmm. I had I had a, I had a herd of over 125 horses and five bulls, and that mule was you get up. And, anyway, did nothing much but get up. Mm -hmm. But but nonetheless, so <clears throat> so all that time we had rodeos, and people would pay five bucks a, a try to ride those 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 uh, those bulls, and, uh, and and then we'd put about 30 or 40 or 50 of those horses out to you know. To, Six or seven or ten at a time, and back, and, and get them all cleaned up, and put them back. And people, we teach them how to clean them up, and uh, and then the the post exchange came across with tens of thousands of dollars of savings of, on, on 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 porcelain ware and and, and and appliances, and oh my goodness, stuff, yeah. And then and then uh, they also they had clothing. Uh, at the dry goods side of it, um, so the, the commissary and the, and the dry goods side of it, the post exchange, uh, provided all kinds of absolute wonderful things, and so I just thought to myself, that's not enough. So I went downtown and I got three banks, half of one percent interest, and I got five automobile car car companies give me maximum maximum unbelievable mil military discounts. And they connected with the bank. I don't get buy, make a deal in a car, and come to one of these three banks. I don't care. I, I, I'm not. I'm out of it. I don't want to hear about it. I just want to know: the, Are you going to be there or not? And let me know how your business went. So those are the things that we set in place, and we had other things going on too. So anyway, <clears throat> we started it, and then the governor of Arizona sent a notice, and he was mad at me because they were having some kind of an annual event in Tombstone their annual shootout, mm -hmm. and we messed that out. Come to find out, they went to that and then they came to us, or they went to us and went to them. And the underground silver uh, mines were open, and said they had people that went there and came to us or vice versa, so they, they really made out on our average. We got on television, mm -hmm. and we got everything, multimedia. We grossed over $1.5 million. And, and, and so we got a, a piece of that and, and put that into, uh, into all the things that we were doing. We had a, a, a GPA, absolutely wonderful golf course. We had a million gallons of water on it every night. Where can you get a million gallons of water? water? In the middle in of Arizona, Arizona, it might be tough. And we were 5,000 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. What we would do is I got half the water out of the water treatment plant that had really been processed as best we could, mixed it with well water, and then every so many months, I, I, when we put out, when we fertilized, we, we also included in there a spray that would melt down the buildup, because you always get buildup when you mix um, the, uh, the, the, the water treatment stuff. Mm -hmm. It crusts took care of that. And then we had the right equipment and mowed the equipment, mowed the areas pristine, absolutely wonderful. Downtown golf course really got upset. <laughs> and we had some many stars that would, would, would want to come to see me and I never talked to any of them. I had to go down and talk post commander. Mm -hmm. Post commander called the Talmadge's Follies. And he's the one that got rid of me. Mm -hmm. How about that? So anyway, uh, one, one of the fun things, we had, a, we had a female black bear show up, about 300 plus pounds, and the first time we found her, one of the ladies came out to pick up the newspaper and heard this and the black bear was drunk in a tree, sleeping. And what has got an apple tree, I didn't know this, what, what happens, a bear eats too many apples, they, they get kind of Mm -hmm. They get kind of woozy, so he climbed the tree, she climbed the tree, passed out, and she was sleeping. I mean, she was in a dead sleep, so she called the Corps of Engineers. What are they going to do with that? So we had to call animal control downtown. And so animal control had to call somebody else, uh, a little bit higher than them, and they had ways of handling 
that that kind of thing in a natural environment, mm -hmm. and so they, uh, they they hit it with a tranquilizer, and the thing whimpered down the tree and broke everybody's heart. They took pictures of it. Oh, they hurt the bear. The, 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 the bear. I don't know. The bear was surprised. Crashed and, and, and passed out. Put her put her in a vehicle. Drove her up to the uh, to the uh, to the t top of the mountain there, or somewhere away from us, uh, in in uh, that area, and and uh, in the Huachuca mountain range, and so everybody breathed. That was really great, and I thought to myself, "Isn't that interesting?" That was Colonel. That was Colonel's row. The best garbage is in Colonel's row. So the bear was after the garbage mm -hmm. in Colonel's row. Three weeks later, we got another call. Same bear, different tree, same problem, same same routine. Haul her off into the Wachuca uh, 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 Mountains. Third time, they said we got to. We, we might kill her. We don't do that. So these guys were from the Federal Service, mm -hmm. you know, the the uh, Park Service. Okay, we're going to fix her this time. Put her out drove her to the Chilcawas, and they're way down on the other side of the valley. We haven't seen her since. But So that was one of our stories, and we made the newspapers and people were laughing, but they, we, we didn't want to hurt that bear. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to hurt that bear. So we learned a lot on that. So we had some really fun things that happened, and we had some sad things that happened. People die that we were surprised at. They took their lives. One of them went home. And there was in, in it, with drinking buddies, and took an early morning, or took an early afternoon off, and, and we and we found her floating, in one of the um, what do you call it, uh, jacuzzi tubs in somebody's mm -hmm. backyard. The widows went down there, and and and, and cleaned the place up. I mean, they, 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 they got her hauled out, and cleaned the place up. We couldn't keep up with it. Betty Contral tried her best. We tried our best. The military police tried their best. The chaplains tried their best to keep up with this stuff. These are civilians, work for us. And then another situation, I don't know that, I, I never did get the full, I don't understand it, but another person shot themselves. Betty Contral and the widow show up. The brains are blown all over the room, bedroom. They cleaned that up. So the family didn't have to put up with that. Mm -hmm. That was interesting, and that was sad, and we didn't know. We, you know, you don't. How, how do you interdict those things? And, and no, I'm in the midst of one, several situations even currently, but it's different than that. All of them are different. Every one of them is different. Before I left, the last thing, one of the last things that happened was. No, I had left. In uh, July of 70, no, July of 83, I was reassigned. And I just felt like I didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wanted things to be done where you could audit it and you could say this is an ethical, proper operation. And there were some things that were going on that I rebelled against. And maybe I goofed up at the same time, so I have to take that. But I was I was made available for reassignment, and I was told my assignment was to come up into here, Michigan, somewhere, or or Minnesota, right next to the Great Lakes. Cold assignment to for for my retirement to, retirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I told my rating officer, who recommended me for this, I said I'm, I'm taking this that I'm being made available to reassignment, and uh, I should take that. With a uh, very positively, and I told the Free Star General who commanded the whole outfit uh, on, at Sunday that uh, I said my farewells to him. He said, "For what?" He was livid. I said, "I'm going to work this out and I'll keep you posted." Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what he did, but I got a new raider and I got people to write stuff, and I, I approved it before they were sent in. What a way! That's stupid. I don't like that either. So I called. I called uh, the signal. Remember, I was, I was, I was there before. I was in Army Security Agency, and, mm -hmm. and I had signal units working for me. Uh, and I was really administration, but 
and I told them what to do to keep out of trouble. So I talked to some ca young captain <clears throat> in the signal uh, group, and that's that same group that had combat support. That, that was one of our areas that we assigned. So they found me a job working as an executive officer of a computer uh, management uh, directorate in the Army Army Material Command, and those computers crunch um, all kinds of what was it, uh, barcode equipment, and the equipment's valued at over eighty-one billion dollars. Everything the Army has has got a number on it somehow, and so they they manage that. Plus, they had small, they had logistics, twelve of those little units or organizations working for them underneath them. And I was the, exe I was the executive uh, officer for the director for the computer, like I say, management. And he was an SES, a senior executive service a gentleman. Uh, and I don't think he ever had, his name was George, I don't think he ever had military service. But he was rebelling because I, I, didn't, I didn't go to war college. But the guys in, in, in the Personnel, uh, Army Personnel Command said, try him. Anyway, so I got in there. And, so, so where was this? So I became the executive officer for the Automated Management Directorate. Automated automation, using automation equipment. I mean, huge stuff. And in and, and 12 different sites. So, but I, I would provide the administration and help him keep his staff straight. And some things are going funny. Uh, if, like for instance, he get somebody going a trip and buy and have 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 lunch and co it cost eighty five dollars. He didn't like that. So I, I, I was I was gonna I was a straight man for him. Right, so what was your home base? My home base was in Alexandria again. I was right down the street from the Army's Military Personnel Command. Okay. Same neighborhood, mm -hmm. different building. Well, all right, so we got started. And uh, while I was there, uh, I, I kept get, getting interrupted because I had to go do something. And if he found out I was doing chaplains, doing something somewhere, trying to help some of the employees. So at some point he invited me up to the flag officers at that command, flag officers uh, weekly uh, Bible reading uh, prayer session. I prayed about everything, and I was the only I, I was a lieutenant colonel, and they were they they, they were either SES equivalent to a one or two star, or brigadiers or higher, and the, and the, and the commanding general was a four star. I was sitting in there, and I sat in there. And, and uh, I went, sometimes when George would travel, he'd take me with me to St. Louis or to different commands, and I'd go back and visit and follow up on something. But it had to do with handling your personnel and goal-oriented behaviors instead of looking at it and you get the product and you don't know what you got. You never evaluated them. You never said, you know, you need to, you know, Raj, you need to look at this harder. You, here you're strong. Here you're, you're making headway, but you're not doing a thing here. Or, or you, you need to be more hard. This is what I want you. This is what I want you to do. This is, this will meet my vision if you if you can do this. I didn't do that, so I got after him on that. And some of them called him up, and they finally they backed down and they said, "Yeah, I guess we need to do it," because I was when I I I've been a consultant with, with, with the with the hospital. I got involved with the stuff, sexual harassment. And we had one guy from the training who reported to the, the, the medical doctor, commander of the, that hospital out in Fort Huachuca, and, and, and apologized. He was calling the nurses and some of his staff at home at two in the morning, propositioning him. And he quit doing that. And I guess he was a colonel or lieutenant colonel, was a colonel, as a medical doctor. And he was so pleased. So anyway, I, I got involved with him. Mm -hmm. and, and so. He invited me up uh, up to that meeting, and I got to know some of the really close, serious things about them. One of them, 
commanded our, our biological, chemical, and such uh, laboratories across the United States. And he, he was really gr gr grief stricken about it because all that stuff would kill you. And some of the, some of the uh, science lab uh, laboratories, they had, uh, they had this thing cordoned off, and, and that's where you had your working with the chemicals or whatever else. Mm -hmm. And then you had another chamber, and then you had another chamber. And you showered and changed, showered and changed, and then came out, showered and changed. And he was afraid if any of those doors got jarred, a little bit become it would take out the whole community and some of it was very persistent and others were very pervasive which means it, it would it would multiply mm -hmm. he said no control he took his life and that was a rock I mean that was not a happy time that was mm -hmm. terrible that would that rocked the entire operation large command just rocked by that and uh, so uh, I was up there praying with the rest of them, and we were weeping when together. Mm -hmm. The senior man up in, in that uh, Army Material Command was a civilian. I, I don't, I, he was a, also an SES, and I don't know what rank he would have been, but he worked just, he worked directly as the aide or assistant technician, science technician, to uh, the four star. In the Army Material Command, mm -hmm. he came to one of those meetings, and he got a call and left. We waited. He came back, and the report was somebody was driving down a major boulevard. I wish I could remember the Washington Parkway or something like that. Driving at 107 miles an hour, being placed by the. Chased by the, the, the lo local police and drove through his car, throwing his wife through the windshield, and when she hit the pavement, she was dead. So he came back to us. The guy that was arrested had an arm load of DUIs, been in jail, been sobered up been in jail, was just out again without a license, and I don't know where he got the car from, and he was drunk. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I guess it was with, within a month or a month and a half, I was still there, he told us what he did. He and his entire family of seven children went down to the detention center, I'd been in there before, and uh, sat down with a guy and wept with him and forgave him and walked out. About a month or so later, a guy by the name of Jim Ralph came into the office. I was on the promotion list to, to, to become a, a full colonel. I, I had to be reassigned. Mm -hmm. At the time that that was announced, a couple of my home study Bible boy uh, fellas said, boy, Fort Huachuca was quiet. <laughs> Nobody was talking. So we just left that fly. One of them was a guy by the name of Bob Gray. Remember that? So anyway, he was a young black guy. He was the same rank as myself. I was one of my students I taught at Commander General's, General's staff. So anyway, uh, I, I uh, George introduced me to Jim. I'd like to meet General Ralph. This is Roger Talmadge. Uh, sir, he's going to be promoted shortly. He's talking to, to, to Jim. So, uh, nice to see you, sir. Hope you have a good day. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, hope to see you soon. I walked out. I didn't know what that meant. So then, I don't know who did it, but I got a phone call for an interview back at the Army, uh, Army personnel command. Mm -hmm. So I, I walked into the office and it was his office. And he didn't see me. I talked to his colonel and the colonel said, you're here for interview and also evaluation. And we we're interviewing and evaluating somebody to take or to be, be the director of field systems. You have, 
in-house computers like mm -hmm. in this hotel, and then you have those out there that communicate with the hotel and keep up on stuff and feed information or update outdated stuff. So that that's, that would be the job. Anyway, so I didn't know it, but I, I talked to everybody in, in, in this this little division or group, whatever you call it, because like the other, you, you had brigadiers that were in charge of the officers, you have another brigadier for enlisted, another brigadier for other things, and another one for computer science stuff. Everything, in and out, external. So anyway, got all finished up, and uh, uh, I didn't know what to think of it. I had no clue what I was doing. People were nice, they were polite, because they always be polite to you. And I, I just I, I just came in saying, talk about everything. And, and, and so I came back to say goodbye to the general, and he's still busy or out. And the colonel said, well, it's nice talking to you. We're, we're going to visit with others, and, uh, <clears throat> and you have a nice day. Well, before I went over there, George had told me, you're the only game in town. <laughs> I said, for what? He said, well, I, I don't know. He didn't know what, 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 what was on Jim's mind. He knew what Jim was doing, because he networked with him. Mm -hmm. His stuff does what his stuff does, only his is on material, and, and, and Jim was people. So anyway, I said, yes, sir. Hope to see you soon. Walked out. Next Monday, I walked in. Hi, Colonel. I'm back. And I went to my office. And so when I got into that office, I, 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 uh, I had a, a couple of secretaries. One, one of them left me, and she got promoted. Anybody, any female that works for me will get promoted within 18 months, at least one grade. She got promoted and went to work for somebody else. Some other lady wanted to work in, to get that promotion where, where, where that was vacant. And so she came in, and she, she told me, I don't fetch things for anybody. Okay, so I fetched coffee for her. But there's other things she didn't do either. And, and, and the one that left was, was, had, had a nice personality and was interested in doing a modicum amount of work, and that's what we needed. I, I developed reports, and I needed help with those reports. I couldn't develop my own reports. and, and probably, I could, but you know, I, I couldn't do that. That's just, I, I had too much. So anyway, uh, I, got, I talked to somebody, somebody, I had a warrant officer by the name, name of Steve Hagen. He was brilliant. He was, a, he was a W4. He'd been around. He's an old dog. That's before they had a W5. They had just come out. He wasn't one of them. So anyway, he'd been in this business since he was a, and he came up through the ranks. He was in combat in Cambodia behind the enemy lines for a long time. Nobody knows that. I was on this side in, in Vietnam, and he was on that side in Cambodia, and he was destroying lines of communication that was vital to our to survival. Anyway, I met him, and uh, so we sat down and said, "We got to we got to get you a new a new secretary. Well, let's get rid of this one first. And I don't know what they did, but she found a better job. Who knows? But she never got a promotion. So then there was." The, a lady, she's tall, about your height, slender. Her name is Sherry Marinoff. And uh, she said, well, do you mind if I sit here and I'll just sort of look after things while you're looking for somebody? Sure. I don't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. <laughs> Nothing. Know what to do. Anyway, so uh, any secretary that works for me has got to be, in that job, had to become an office manager. Now, I, I wasn't looking for a secretary. I don't need somebody to really bring me a coffee or hold mm -hmm. my hand or anything else. So, um, so she, uh, she, was, she was nice and she bring coffee to me and, and one time when I came in and, and, uh, uh, and I got my coffee and I sat down, she came in my office and put her hands on her hips and she says, you ever touch, touch that cup again, I'll break your fingers. Walked out. I said, I think she's going to stay. I didn't know what to do with her. So here's what happened. We started training her. Steve was training her what he knew, and I trained her what I needed help with. So Steve would go on a lot of trips and gather information, and he, they taught me the, the, the in, in, interior, and, and Steve taught me how to gather information from the worker. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, 
if, 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 I, if I was with them, I wouldn't go talk to the workers per se. I would talk to the, 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 the ranking personnel and keep them busy so our guys could go down and talk to the workers uninterrupted. No, n none of this filtering stuff. Mm -hmm. And what they taught us are things that we repaired the current system. In 1984-85, we, we, we solved the X2Y program problem, you know, where you go from six digits to eight because you have to put the full year, not 02, could be 1902 or 2002, mm -hmm. okay, or two, 2002. So we solved that ahead of time, we put that on a new seat, a machine. They designed the physical, the physical uh, hardware for that new field machine that you could pick up and actually carry. Mm -hmm. And it had a communication system in it. With two, two, two always, we had a minimum of two satellites or, 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 or maximum of three on each, wherever you put one of these devices. We wrote a, a million lines of code from the, from the bigger system loaded into, because this thing had a lot of capability, uh, storage capability and, and compute power to move that stuff around. And, and, and Steve was in the middle of all of it, the, the, phys the physical and the, the uh, software side of it, the hard and the soft. And I had a guy that was well into his 70s and he built the old system and when they ran punch cards and all kinds of weird systems and they had a million lines of codes on 11 baselines, lemon, I mean seven different di compilers. They were made by different manufacturers and they didn't agree with each other. Now, remember I have or order of battle background. Mm -hmm. I said, we're gonna get rid of those baselines. So we got down to three. We killed two of them. And the other three became uh, amenable to each other. I'll put it that way. And I'm smiling like a Cheshire cat because mm -hmm. the idea is Whichever one gets weak is the first one to go. But these would crunch it down so they so all these were the same, all the field ones. And then and then we we we, we tested. We went to Fort <coughs> uh, wherever it was in in, in uh, Georgia, and the 24th Infantry Division uh, and General uh, Schwarzkopf. Ever hear that name? Mm -hmm. He was two star there. Very fine gentleman. Smoked a cigar. Swore like a sailor. And um, that was the kind of guy he was. And so we helped him get a, a, a blue star rating for accuracy and timeliness of personnel data. He, he loved it. Because all of his systems were catching up. This, by us building the new system, the, uh, the, the, the everyday system would catch up with it. Because all of a sudden these changes would appear and we wouldn't tell anybody. We, we'd announce it and the guys down here got it. But the upper, they, they, didn't, they didn't understand. And if they got it, they wouldn't know how to read it anyway. I didn't. I didn't read it. I just, they told me what it was, I believed it. You know, it's magic. So anyway, so we, 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 did, we worked on that, and, and uh, that, that, that worked out uh, very fine. Uh, then the, the, the project manager that was on it retired. So here I am, two years, two years into this thing, and I now have, I am now the project manager for a two point, I mean, for a four point six billion dollar project, and I don't even know. I I don't even know how to spell some of the words these guys use to communicate with each other. I had Steve and his buddies, his buddies, recruit everybody to work for us because we had access to the top one half of all civilian or military, doesn't matter what the rank was, uh, technicians in the United States Army. And we got them from the National Guard. I had them working for them. I raided them, and the Army Reserve. So the National Guard Bureau recognized what we were doing and knew knew me personally. Mm -hmm. I also worked with the Office of uh, 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 the uh, you know, the Chief of the Army uh, Army Reserve, which became the U.S. Army Reserve Command in the Pentagon. That's now a four-star. So. National Guard Bureau was a four-star. The Army Reserve was a three-star until it was command. Mm -hmm. that's like, okay, so that's that. So Sherry came in, and we'd travel around the world and do stuff, and I took Europe, and, and Steve took a little bit with me too, and, but he, he, he sent the teams to other parts of the world because I, I know the languages there, I'm comfortable mm -hmm. there, I've never been in Asia except for 
Vietnam or, or wherever, that kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, and they trained me how to give a briefing on this stuff. So finally I started briefing this stuff. I come into Germany for a worldwide <clears throat> uh, personnel briefing and, uh, and a conference and, and we talk about detailed stuff so these guys could, could get the latest but they learned it through their, their, their su su supervisor line and the top guys would show up and I don't know what they do because they didn't understand what was going on. One of the things that we did, uh, General <coughs> uh, Jim Ralph, he didn't hire me for my functional knowledge, but for my knowledge to one, build teams and love that team. Mm -hmm. That's it. And he never bothered me. So Sherry got to a point where she felt sorry for him, and once in a while he'd come in and he'd be, you know, he, he worked long hours too, and so she went out and bought him a beautiful porcelain cup and saucer and a little spoon that went with it. So, he, so she, she was a lovely lady, loved to, lovely to look at, lovely to talk to, had a brain in her head, and so she'd bring that and put it on her desk as he sat down. And he said, oh, you can't do that for me. She said, you know what, you don't want me to tell you what I told you that, that spring thing, do you? Good, enjoy, goodbye. And she'd walk out. And her husband was this tall and she was this big. And so whenever I got in trouble with somebody, Peter would tell me, T tell my wife Sherry, she'll take care of that mm -hmm. for you. Because she was mean, so I mean, when, when things went nuts. <laughs> okay, so Jim, Jim permitted us to cheat. Point six billion dollars. How do you spend that stuff? And you and everything's uphill. Nobody's ever done this stuff. You have to test it and make it work. It took a while for for General Schwarzkopf stuff to work perfectly well. I mean, it's, it's, it's as perfect as mm -hmm. human possible. Anyway, so what we did on Highway 80, uh, uh, 50 coming out of Washington D.C. is what we call the Mel Par Building. We 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 uh, rented the whole sh shoebang, the, the shebang the Army did, and we had a piece of it. I don't know how many square foot it was, a couple thousand square foot. And, and we put 35 men and women in there with lots of space between them. And all we do is once in a while, and Jim knew we were doing this, we'd back a truck up, open up the chute, and dump the money down it, pick it up, and drive away. Carte blanche, buy what you need. And they bought the first laptops that cost $14,000 and it had eight megabytes of something. And then look what we got now. Mm -hmm. And so we went from that. And we started with those, and they would test stuff and, and, and send us side, electronically side stuff that we went in, put in our, 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 our in the building system that it impacted all, all the other uh, desktops. So we did that. And then, <clears throat> then we go to, every year we had to defend our, our, our budget. And they couldn't figure out, Congress couldn't figure out when, when our button was pushed to, to report. You're always ahead of time within your budget. You weren't always this way. Something's funny is going on. I'd send a Sergeant E6 over there sometimes, or maybe Steve or somebody else. I wouldn't go. What do they need me for? Mm -hmm. I'm busy. I got things to do. And, and, and I, I don't know, I don't even know those people. Do you know anybody? I don't know anybody in Congress. And the sergeant, the reason they did, and, and sergeant, I mean, and General Jim Ralph uh, 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 supported that because they had the answers. I don't. I have to ask them. Why? Why ask them? And I got in front of them once a couple times, and I and I told them who's going to brief them when they when they came into my office. These these high ranking, uh, mostly military, and I said. Staff Sergeant Jones is going to talk to you about A, B, M, F. And one officer, Jones over here, or Steve, is going to talk to you about the, everything in between plus G. But you have to have it in sequence. I, I just told you because they told me that's logical. And if you, did any, and if you do it sequentially like this, you get lost. And I'm lost, and so please trust me what I just said. If you have any questions, I'm still, I'll be sitting right here. And so they got finished with the sergeant and asked him his question. He said, uh, that, that'll be talked about and so and so. Uh, that'll be talked about and so and so. I, I yes, I'll review that for you right now. And then when Steve or whatever the warrant officer did, got in, 
they walked away with the confidence that this system was complicated and it's building, being built systematically with, with strength and convi conviction that it's going to work. And uh, when, when your underlings get it and you start seeing the results yourself, you, you'll, you'll be able to, by those clear facts, uh, uh, receive it and, 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 and support it and laud it or you know, help the people so when they come in, to, to, the new ones will learn it because the new system and we had people that were retiring. So, all right, so they got that started. Got that started. And um, let's see, what else do we do? I remember one time, one time we had to go in and we had, we, we had to turn on a lot of, almost all the satellites. Because we, we had all the 20, 22,000 of those boxes out there. 22,000 would replace all the stuff that's in the building. Any building in the world. We had to test. You know what the light bill on that was? $81 million. Getting back to Sherry Marinoff, I'd come back from a trip and I had a framework and I just filled it in with a few words. This is my report. Mm -hmm. I walked away. Later that day, she would give me the full thing and very seldom did I even have to change anything because we had some basic things that we've been talking about all along. She had that. All she had to do is take this out, move this over here, and put this in to say this satisfies item so and so that was brought up in the last report and here's what's happening and where we are with it. So we, we, got, we got across the board with these 22,000 machines. We got, uh, it, it was 99.6% accurate and no older than 48 hours. When I inherited, it was sometimes 18 months old and it had one standard deviation accuracy. That's 27, 28%. That's trash. Mm -hmm. So what kind of data or information are we talking about here when you're getting this? The, the the information that I have on you, we pull it up and okay. ninety nine point six percent accurate, and the latest data we had when you got that new car and registered this morning, mm -hmm. and what color it is, and by the way, you haven't had it inspected. Very good. That's nuts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you what happened. Schwartz called. Went into Steve had a nice relationship uh, with General Schwarzkopf. General Schwarzkopf would scream at, at Steve Hagen, and Steve Hagen would re return in kind, like mm -hmm. kind. So everybody was up on, on on plane. So went in there and he said, "You know, we've got this, we've got this system, and you've told us that you've evaluated yourself, and all your people reporting to you that it's it's doing well for you. It's it, it's fast and it's accurate, and it's it's usable. It's a usable form for you, for you and your team." and you're getting good grades from those that grade what you do here. We need to start developing our wartime system. And right in the middle of that, he says, you can't touch it. You touch it, I'll, 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 I'll have you run off this installation. Well, going back to the 1st Battalion, 8th Cav, 1st Cav Division in Vietnam, our operations officer was a guy by the name of Edward Verba. He was a major in the United States Army. At the time that General Schwarzkopf blew his top, we made a couple phone calls out to the 7th Division near Coronado, out in that area in California. Major General Ed Berber was commanding. Say, General Berber, I'm from your old battalion. You're the operations officer. I came in later. I need a site to test. Uh, this uh, the system. He says, "Come on, out, let's talk." All right. Yeah. Just successfully.